live. Um, if you want to like, share, and comment on our live this morning, and also after the sermon, you can send your questions to Gary, and we'll be doing a question and answer. Good morning, guys. Everybody's standing already. That's good. I'm going to read something from Psalm 100 right here. This is a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all the generations. And let's just lift our hands today. This is just saying we surrender, Lord. We're giving everything to you. We're giving our hearts. This is just us and him. We're just connecting and singing praise to the Lord today. So let's go.
you took on our frame you walked in our pain and now you're taking us higher you stepped into time you laid down your life to save us you took all our shame on the cross it was laid and now you're taking us higher we pray for glory to glory Lord, we'll never be the same, we'll never be the same, we go from glory to glory to glory, we're forever changed, we're forever changed, you call me a friend. Brought into your endless peace. By the blood I was made, no longer a slave.
can separate even if I ran away your love never fails I know I still make mistakes but you have new mercy for me every day your love never fails come on y'all sing it
Lord, through everything, through our walking away, Lord, through our praising and lifting you up here, the good times, when we're at the mountaintop, Lord, and when we're in the valley, Lord, I thank you for being there when we don't feel you. And Lord, I'm sorry for when I don't act that way, Lord. And today, we just bring our hearts before you and I pray for Gary as he leads us, Lord, and through your word, and I just pray that each and every one of us has receptive hearts and open ears to hear what you're trying to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Praise Band. We appreciate your work and your service to the Lord there. Fourth grade and younger, you may be dismissed to the children's room. Right over here to your left, my right. And y'all go here and learn about Jesus over there. That'd be great. Man, didn't the Praise Band do a good job? Give them a hand. That was great. I figure if David starts doing better on the drum, drums, I might let him out of jail some Sunday soon. So, right, someday we'll be cage-free drummers here. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18. I'm going to ask you to read along with me. I'm going to read the first slide, and you read every other slide with me. Does that sound good? Say amen if that sounds good. All right. So Deuteronomy 18, it says, The Levitical priests, all the tribe of Levi, shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. And let's together on the second slide here. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. And this shall be the priest's due from the people, from the, those offering a sacrifice. Whether an ox or a sheep, they shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. The first fruits of your grain and of your wine and of your oil and the first fleece of your sheep you shall give him. For the Lord your God has chosen him out of all the tribes to stand and minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons, for all time. And if a Levite comes from any town of your town, from any of your towns, out of all of Israel, where he lives, and he may come when he desires to the place that the Lord will choose, and the ministers in the name of the Lord, his God, like all his fellow Levites who stand to minister there before the Lord then he may have equal portions to eat besides what he receives from the sale of his patrimony. Together on verse 9, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or sorcerer or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. Verse 13, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. Together on verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And who will not listen, who, I'm sorry, let me start over, I messed you all up. Verse 19 together. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord? If the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. So, Father, we, we thank you for your word because it is what we need this morning. We need to hear from you. We, we are so glad that you are in this place. So, Father, this morning, give us what we do not have. Teach us what we do not know. Give me words that I am not eloquent enough to speak. So, Father, I just pray that you would be our sufficiency and you would be everything and that we would see Jesus in this passage. 
Because Jesus is who we need to see. He's the one who changes lives, changes hearts, and, and changes me. So, Father, we ask for that, and we just thank you in advance for that answer. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. You know, it's interesting about wildernesses in the Bible. Israel is in a wilderness, and they are about to go into the promised land. They're not there yet, okay? Moses is preaching one of the longest sermons. You think I preach long. Moses is preaching for days, okay? This, this whole book is one long sermon. So in the length it takes you to read it, that's how long Moses preached. And that's maybe not including all other details that could have been there. But uh, you see wilderness is a lot in the Bible. Do you feel like maybe you're in a wilderness? Like, like things are kind of dry right now between you and God? And maybe you just don't really know where you're going. <laughs> and is this path leading anywhere? Maybe you feel like you're just kind of wandering aimlessly. You know, you can relate because God allowed that and even ordained that for our good several places in the Bible. Uh, Moses wasn't the only one. Um, Jacob had a time in the wilderness. In fact, not just once, but twice because he was so thick-headed that he didn't get the lesson the first time. So he spent a long time in the wilderness. Moses, as we know in this prop, promise, here he is with it, it, Israel in the wilderness, but he went through his own wilderness experience. Remember, the first 40 years of his life, he lived where? In Egypt. And then when he committed manslaughter, whether it was accidental or intentional, whatever, I'll just call it manslaughter, he fled. So he was out in the wilderness for how long? 40 years. Then he gets Israel out and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So he lived for 120, nice even 40 sections. But Moses had, his, had really two stints in the wilderness, if you will. And then you see Hagar. Remember, it was Sarah's great idea to make a baby through Hagar because she wasn't willing to wait on God's promises. And obviously neither was Abraham. And so they make a baby with her maidservant. But then... When she finally has this baby, guess who's jealous that she had a baby? Sarah. And that doesn't make any sense. She's like, well, get rid of this woman. So Abraham says, here's a bottle of water. Go out into the wilderness. And they're basically out there to die. But then the Lord meets Hagar there. Um, she's not the only one. Elijah spent time in the wilderness. And, and he grew out there. John the Baptist, where was his preaching forum? In the wilderness. He didn't preach in the temple. He didn't preach in some nice building. He didn't preach in the shade. He said, if you want to hear the truth, you got to come out to me. And I'm going to preach in, out here in the wilderness. And John the Baptist preached repentance out in the wilderness. And then, of course, Jesus, as soon as he's baptized, it says he's led away by the Spirit to go where? Out in the wilderness. Now, see, think about that. We think the Holy Spirit only leads to good and pleasant places. <laughs> but First thing on, your, your, on Jesus' ministry is, okay, let's spend 40 days in the wilderness. And so you see that happening. And so my question this morning is, how about you? How, are you feel like you're in a wilderness time right now? Or if you're not, you may soon be. But let me just say this. As this you could kind of tell that the theme of the music was this morning was God's glory and how God is glorified in us and that we go from glory to glory to glory. Do you know how God accomplishes that? It's not by giving you a raise and giving you more beauty from children and all these things, although all those things are great blessings. You grow the most in the tough times. And we don't like it. We pray, God, give us a safe trip with no problems, and God, give us this with no problems, and don't let anybody get sick and all that stuff. We pray for all the things that actually make us stronger. They say in the weight room, no pain, no gain. And yet we're always praying for no pain, no pain, and yet that's not the way God works. He, he works in the wilderness. And you know what's interesting about the wilderness? God led them by, during the day, how did he lead them? By a pillar of cloud, basically a whirlwind of a cloud during the day. And at night, he led them with a pillar of fire. And I always thought that was really cool because that's something that's really visible that you could see. But I didn't realize till this past week that not only was God's glory something amazing to behold because I'm sure maybe it looked even much bigger than these pictures, okay? But think about it. They're in the wilderness in a desert climate, which is hot as could be during the day and gets really, really cold at night. And what was God doing for them in the day? He's got a whirlwind blowing coolness around 
And the closer you are to the Lord, the cooler you feel. And at night, when it gets nice and cold, what does he got going? A glowing fire. So the closer to the Lord, the more warmth you feel. So even in God's presence, there is comfort in the midst of the wilderness. And that's exactly what God wants you to learn. That as you're going through a wilderness, whether it's now or to come, God wants you to draw close to him so that you find your comfort in him and not in the things. Not in the things around you. So there's three points from Deuteronomy 18 that we're going to go through quickly this morning. Number one is providing for a better priesthood. Number two, purging out pagan practices. And number three, a promise of a better prophet. Say that three times fast, right? Um, so in verse one, it says that the Levitical, so all Levites, all the priests were Levites, but not all, not all Levites were priests, okay? So some of them were the priests and some of them were assistants to the priests, but they were all ministering in the temple, helping with the work of God. And they were not, when they went into the land, the promised land, they divided up amongst the 12 tribes, proportioned to their populations, but the Levites got nothing. They didn't get any property, any land. And what God wanted, to do, wanted, them, wanted them to learn is to totally depend on him and his people. To totally depend on him as provided through his people. So people were making these sacrifice offerings to the Lord, but then they didn't just sit there and rot. The Levitical priest and the priesthood and the Levites and all the assistants would eat that. And that would be how they survived. So they were not going to get rich off the ministry. And you can see that principle. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And it says that, that he wanted them to learn that when you think, when you grow up, what am I going to inherit from my parents? Or what am I going to have to pass on to my kids? You're going to pass on the Lord is what you're going to pass on. Your inheritance is the Lord. So, you know, you know your, your dad passes away and they're all at the funeral and the law, lawyer opens the paperwork and says, your father has left you the Lord. <laughs> that's what he left you. And you say, well, that's all? What do you mean that's all? The Lord is everything. And that's exactly the lesson he wanted them to learn by this, by this principle here. And so how does this translate into the New Testament church and, and paying pastors? You know, we're not in a theocracy we're not living in the promised land. We're not the nation of Israel. So we're not going to take all those verses and say, you know, you need to sacrifice this lamb on this day and do all these things. That was then. So, but there are principles there that we can apply to today. So in 1 Timothy 5, it says, let the elders, which also can be translated bishop, pastor, overseer, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of a double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Verse 18 says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Now picture this. you got an ox tied to a, a crossbar, and he walks in circles, and you keep pouring out grain on the ground. And as he rolls the stone that he's pulling over it, he crushes and he's grinding the grain. If he bows, if he bows his head a little bit while he's walking and, sl and licks up a little bit of grain, don't muzzle him and say, no, don't eat that. You can only mash it and you can only grind it but you can't eat it they're like that's not fair if the animal's hungry he's doing the work let him also benefit from what he is giving to you and so that's the principle right here so it says and then he says uh the laborer deserves his wages if, if a pastor works hard and like it says in the previous verse especially if he works hard in preaching and teaching he's worthy of being paid and so again this is what the scripture is talking about and some people have a hard time with this in fact you, you will see denominations and churches go to two extremes with this. But really, like almost everything else in life, it's a, seeking out a balance. You, uh, one extreme is the greedy and the overpaid. Anybody recognize this house right here? Where is that? Right here. Whose house is that? That's Joel Osteen's house. One of several. <laughs> this is his Houston home. And obviously, he makes lots of money being a pastor. And... And I, I personally don't think it's right. I think that the principle in the Levitical priesthood was we, we want you to have enough. We want you to do okay, but we don't want you to get rich off the ministry. And then you can also see that there's, there's a principle for that in the New Testament. In fact, let's read what 1 Timothy goes on to say. It says, this is a trustworthy, this is a saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, which again is also translated elder, pastor, bishop, they're all the same thing. Okay, it's all the same Greek words. So denominations say, well, I have a bishop over me and this and this and this, all these different levels. They're just reading the Bible wrong. It says, if he desires that though, he desires a noble task, okay? 
And I'm thankful to the Lord that when I was 15, I was called into the ministry, and I love, I can't imagine myself doing anything else different. And so I'm glad the Bible calls it a noble task. It says, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. He needs to have a reputation where he doesn't do things that are questionable. He doesn't do things that would make people say, wow, really? Why is he the pastor? And so it goes on to say, the husband of one wife, amen, praise God, I got Tammy, sober-minded, means he, he knows when to be serious, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, means he opens his home, he, he, he shares with people, he practices hospitality, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, I'm working on that one, just kidding, uh, not quarrelsome, and then here's the main thing about this context, not a lover of money, and again, you see a lot of People in the ministry, especially in the prosperity gospel, that, you know, the more you love God, the richer you are. And since I'm the pastor, I love more God than, I love, love God more than all y'all. That's why I drive the big private jet and wear the Rolex. Man, that is so not biblical. That is so not biblical. In fact, they need to be the one who's an example of not loving money and not being gu guilty of, of gain. So you see those extremes here. Number two, people go the other direction to where they're like, no, pastor shouldn't make anything. He needs to be working just like the rest of us. And here's the problem with that. It puts them in a situation where they're unable to minister effectively. Okay? Think about this. You, you need to have your appendix removed. You go see a doctor, and the doctor says, well, really, my full-time job is I'm a plumber, but I study medicine on the side. Are you going to have him operate on you? Okay? Or you go to, you want to get your pipes fixed. And the guy says, I'm a librarian, but I practice plumbing on the side. Is he going to fix your frozen pipes from this last freeze? Probably not. You want an expert. You want someone who can show, even if you're going to learn from someone else, you want someone who makes that their full life vocation. And that's what you saw Paul doing is when, when the ministry was new, he's like, if you want to give me an offering, great. If you don't, I'm going to make tents. And so he made tents in most cities, but he really got, praised the Philippians. He said, you know what? I can minister day and night because you guys support my ministry and therefore, I can study the word of God, witness to people, preach the gospel, minister to the sick, and all those different things because I can dedicate myself fully to that because you're not muzzling the ox. So here, what you see, unfortunately, is in a lot of um, cults, they don't have paid pastors. Why do you think that is? Why is it interesting that the, the, most, the biggest cults in America don't have paid pastors? Because if you had someone studying the Bible full time, they would figure out that this cult is messed up. <laughs> they would say, this, we're being taught things that are wrong. But because they do it as a part-time thing like a hobby, and they rotate their pastors through, they never can study enough to know that what they're being taught is wrong. This right here is the, uh, the Clear City Mall up in Salt Lake City, Utah. It is owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is a $2 billion mall. It has underground parking and everything you could ever imagine in this thing, and it's owned by the Mormons, okay? The Mormons do not pay their pastors on purpose because if they would study the Bible enough, they would know this church is jacked up. This church is so whacked. They teach all kinds of crazy stuff, and they, t they teach that Jesus is the spirit twin brother of Lucifer, and that Lucifer got mad when Jesus was given the kingdom and not Lucifer, so that's why Lucifer turned into Satan and became demonic. Where, in that in the, where is that in the Bible? You know, this is the kind of stuff that they teach. It's all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff. Um, and so when you pay your pastor, you're, you're following the principle of Deuteronomy of providing for a better priesthood. Um, and then the second thing is purging out pagan practices. I just realized there's a bit. Okay. Anyway, purging out pagan practices. Um, when you come into the land that your Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow abominable practices of those nations. See, them coming into the promised land wasn't the, just them coming in. It was about who was going out. The people that were in the land of Canaan, the promised land, were wicked, evil people. And God was not only giving a blessing to Israel, but he was showing discipline or punishment for the evil of the Canaanites and all their, their abominable practices. Abominable, the only time we probably say abominable nowadays is we think about a snowman, but it's not what it's talking about here. Abominable here means that what absolutely makes you want to just throw up. Like you might hear about a, on the news about someone being kidnapped and yada, 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 and you're just like, oh my gosh, how could people be so sick? That's abominable. So these are things that's not, God doesn't say, well, I'd rather you not do that. It's no, 
You're really making me ill when you do these things. And that's what was going on in the situation here. So number one, and it gives a list of nine things they were doing. We're just going to go through them quickly, not reread the scripture. They were sacrificing their children in the fire. They were sacrificing children. I mean, that, that ought to make everybody in this room sick, right? And, and it, was, it wasn't just that they were killing them painlessly. They were doing it in the fire. In fact, the, the statue of Baal had two iron arms, but the, the inside of it was hollow, and they would fill it up with fire so that these things would become basically uh, grills. And they would lay their children on that. Just, just, uh, but you think, how can people get so far down the line that they would do that? They would sacrifice their children. Um, how about 3,000 a day in America? Okay, we're doing it. So I don't, we can't point back then and say, oh, those pagan, ignorant people, we're sacrificing children on the idol of convenience and education and careers and, and lifestyle. So we're doing the exact same thing. We're not any any better than they are. Number two, witchcraft, which was seeking to determine the will of, God, of the gods by examining or interpreting omens. So witchcraft was forbidden, and they, again, they were practicing that. Number three, soothsaying, which was attempting to control the future through the power given by evil spirits. Number four, interpreting omens, telling future based on signs, kind of like tea leaves and things like that. Uh, sorcery, which was inducing magical effects by drugs or some other sort of potion. Number six, conjuring spells. In other words, binding other people by magical muttering. Number seven, being a medium, which was one who supposedly communicates with the dead, but actually is communicating with a demon. Let me tell you, the dead do not speak to us, okay? When you say, well, I just feel like my uncle's trying to tell me this. No, the, the dead do not speak to us. The Bible makes it very clear we're forbidden to speak to the dead. So if you hear anything you think is from your grandma who passed away, it's a demon impersonating in that situation. Number eight, being a spiritualist or one who has an intimate acquaintance with the demonic and the spiritual world. And number nine, calling up the dead, investigating and seeking information from the dead, which I just mentioned. And you say all these things, they, that seems like things they did way back then. No, no, all these things are alive and well in the New Age movement, in Hinduism, in all kinds of world religions, they are still alive and well, and even in so many things called so-called Christian. If you are getting involved in any of these things you might see on the screen, you need to watch out, okay? One of the questions was asked last week during question and answer session is, how does someone get demon-possessed? There's a lot of different ways, but here's a good start. Or I should say, this is a bad start. Here's what's happening. We are spiritual beings, okay? We are created in the image of God. God, God is one God who manifests in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And then God said, let us, plural, make man in our image, plural. So we are also a pl plurality. We are body, soul, and spirit. I am one person, uh, I'm one being, but I, am, I have three parts, right? And so there is a part of me that is spiritual. Just like my body craves food, too much of it, obviously, but my spirit craves to be in contact with the spiritual. What is the only spiritual being we should be in contact with? It is God. We are created for him. Every single one of you has a God-shaped hole in your heart that can only be filled by him. But when we try to fill it with something or someone else, we're asking for trouble. So you're like, I want a supernatural answer. I want to know, am I going to get this job? Should I marry this guy? Should I go to that college? Whatever it may be. And I want an answer, but I don't want it from you, God. Is there anyone else out there? And you know what? That prayer will get answered. If you're looking for spiritual answers beside the ones you're supposed to be spiritually connected to, you are asking for, for big trouble. It says, you shall not be blameless before the Lord. Your, you shall be blameless before your, Lord, your God. Blameless means you should have nothing to do with it. You don't dabble in it. You don't joke around about it. You just stay free and clear from all those things. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. God is forbidding it. And when God says don't or thou shalt not, don't think, oh, God's a party pooper. God's just trying to spoil my fun. Think of it this way. God is saying, I don't want you to hurt yourself. I don't want you to hurt yourself. So when God says, don't have sex before marriage, it's, oh man, that's, that's just unreasonable. That's so old fashioned. No, he's saying, I don't want you to hurt yourself. I want you to have the best marriage possible and being faithful to one person and experiencing incredible intimacy with them on such levels you can't even imagine. And I don't want you to destroy that because of your, your past history. And you can just think, come up with any command where God says, don't, 
It's because I love you. And he's saying, I don't want you to hurt yourself. So we have providing for a better priesthood, purging out pagan practices, and now the third one, promise of a better prophet. The promise of a better prophet. It says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. And here's the key word, like me. Everybody say like me. Like me. Put that in the back, your memory bank here for just a second. So this prophet that God's going to raise up is like Moses. And think about, run through your mind all of the way, things that Moses was like. One, I'll just give you one right now. The Bible says he was more humble than any other man. Which is interesting because we read that in the book of Exodus and Moses wrote it. <laughs> so he wrote it about himself. And, but he's inspired by God. So he's writing along and God's telling him what to write. And God says, and Moses was more humble than any other man. What, God? You want me to write that? Yeah, you're going to write that. But God, how can I say I'm the most humble man and I'm the one writing it? Just go ahead. They'll understand later. So he says, and he's supposed to do it from among you. So this person has to be an Israelite. Remember that Israel, remember Jesus said, you are a city set on a hill. He's talking about Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and how all the world was supposed to be drawn to the light. And then in the New Testament, he says, go, you are the light of the world individually. Go out in all the world. So you see the plan changing. Everybody's drawn in Israel. So Israel was an open country where other people could come in. And did you know that baptism was in the Old Testament? Yeah, if you were a Gentile, let's say, let's say you were Rahab, the harlot. You were into prostitution and all kinds of bad stuff and even into pagan worship. But you can see that, hey, this Jehovah God, he's the real deal. And so you tell Joshua and Caleb, the spies, hey, I believe your God's real. Can you spare me and my family? I'll help you. You help me. And they're like, sure, no problem. Tie, tie the red cord on your window. We'll, the God will knock down all the city walls except for this part of it. And we'll come in and we'll make sure and we'll get you out, okay? What she would do to convert to uh, Judaism is to be baptized. And she was now a Jew. Maybe her lineage and her DNA was not Israeli, but she became part of the nation. But in this situation... If you, I'm going to raise a prophet, but he won't be a foreigner who's become an Israeli. He will be one from the tribes, okay? He'll be from specifically from your brothers, from the 12 tribes. And it is to him you shall listen. So pay attention to this prophet. And he says, just as you desired the Lord your God at Horeb, the day of the assembly, when you said, Let, let's not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. So God told everybody, hey, come to the mountain, come close. And then the mountain trembled and God spoke. And they all said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to hear this anymore. Moses, you go up. We, we can't handle this anymore. And, and as we learned about a month ago, the reason was because they had sin in their heart. It's interesting. When you hear the voice of God, it convicts you of your sin. And you're either going to get rid of your sin or you're going to step away from the voice of God. Okay? So that's what they were doing. He says, yeah, that's what you did. And they're like, man, we don't even want to see this fire. We don't want to hear this voice lest we die. Because the sinful self needs to die. If we repent, we live. But if we don't, we would die. So they wanted to stay at a distance and let God, let Moses be the one who spoke to God. And, and the Lord says, yeah, you're right. You are going to die if you don't repent of your sin and you come near the mountain. So he makes it very clear what's going on here. Let me just say this. Don't let anybody stand in the presence of God for you. You do it yourself. Does that make sense? In other words, well, it must be true. Pastor Gary said it. Uh -uh, uh -uh. You go study your Bibles. Did you know that the Bible says in 1 Peter that we are all a royal priesthood? Every single one of us can go into the presence of God and pray. We're supposed to go boldly before the throne of grace. We're supposed to open the word of God and study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needs, that the rightly dividing the word of God. Each one of you have that responsibility. So don't let someone else be spiritual for you or be in touch with God for you. We are all the priests of God, and we are all to make, have a personal relationship with him. And it says, and I will put my words in his mouth, this, this, spot, this prophet that is to come. And whoever will not listen to my words that, it, uh, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. In other words, you don't listen to this prophet that's going to be like Moses has come, you'll answer to me, is what God's saying. He said, I, you, I'll, I'll require what's implied is your life. You'll have, to, you'll have to answer to me on that situation. The prophet, and then he, he talks about the opposite of this great prophet to come. He said, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods 
So whether you say, I'm speaking for Jehovah, but you're speaking something Jehovah didn't say, or you're speaking for Baal or Moloch or Dagon, that prophet should die. And again, don't try to apply this here in the 21st century. We're not living in a theocracy. We're not under Deuteronomistic law, law, okay? This was for this place and this time. So we're, don't kill somebody who's preaching a false gospel, okay? Don't say that I said that. I'm not saying. In this situation, though, in Israel, they did because this was treason. These other people preaching these other gods and prophets, they were at war with them, okay? So it'd be like if you're in a foxhole in World War II and, you know, and you're shooting at the enemy and the Nazis and all that stuff, and, and then the, the fi- ceasefire stops for a little bit, and you're like, you catch your breath, and the guy next to me goes, goes, you know, I think this Hitler guy, I don't think he's all that bad. Uh, that guy needs to be out of here fast and possible, and, and the military still does put people to death for treason because it's a threat to the nation. That's what's going on here. So don't read into the Bible something that we're, you know, like atheists always want to say, well, you Christians, you don't apply every part of the Bible. You pick and choose. Well, yes, we do pick and choose because we're not all going to go out and build an ark out of gopher wood. Okay? That was for Noah. There are certain things that are for certain people in the Bible that we don't apply to ourselves. But we can still learn from the principles of them, and there's a definite principle here. It says, and if you say in your heart, how may we know? And this is the question you need to be asking yourself all the time. You hear preachers on the radio, and there's lots of good ones. There's lots of bad ones, lots of good ones. You see them on TV, some good ones, some bad ones. On TV, I think it's mostly bad, but anyway, you read lots of books, some good, some bad. You can get the truth, praise God, from a lot of places besides Revolution Church. So we're, we're not one of those places that say, if you want the truth, oh, you have to come here. There's no other church like us. That's not true. Thank God there's lots of Bible-believing churches, okay? But how do you know, okay? The, the, the word, how do you know they're speaking for the Lord? We're going to talk about that here in a second. Watch some of these details here. He says, if the word does not come to pass or come true. In other words, it doesn't happen at all or it doesn't happen the way that they said it would. They're wrong. Okay, and it, there's, no, there's no mulligans here, okay, for you golfers. There's no like, well, can I have a second chance? You see none of this. It says that the Lord, the word has not spoken. That, that prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Isn't that interesting to be afraid of him? Because what a lot of these prophets were prophesying was doom and gloom and the world's going to come to an end, all that stuff like that. And they're like, oh my gosh, you know, the prophet said this. And, and you could say, well, you know, to your husband, well, the last time you prophesied, it didn't come true, so let's not be afraid of him. But there's a lot of false prophets that have gone out into the world. Anybody recognize who this is? This is Joseph Smith. He is the founder of the LDS Church, which I mentioned earlier. He had a ton of false prophecies, a ton, okay? I'm just going to go over a few. So he, when he asked God, and God the Father and the Son appeared to him personally, and he, even though the Bible says no man shall see God and live, but he, the Father appeared to him personally, and he said, which church is true? The Father said, none of them are. They've all died. Even though Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell, hell will not prevail against it, evidently they did because God told Joseph Smith, no, the church is dead. Jesus Christ's church, the one he started 2,000 years ago, well, at this point, 1,600 years ago, is dead. Even though Jesus said it would not die, okay? He said, you need to start a new one. So God revealed to him who the new 12 apostles were, and he names these men that were some of his, Joseph Smith's disciples, and he said, these 12 apostles will, be the, enter, will come in and present the new kingdom and will be my apostles forever. Well, seven of them he kicked out of the church later. And a couple of them walked away and just said, you're a heretic, we're out of here. So that prophecy didn't come true. He said that the temple, like it was in Jerusalem, would be rebuilt in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, I've been there. There's not one. Okay? That prophecy didn't come true. He prophesied that in 56 years from today, the U.S. government would fall because the U.S. government was, was on his back about his marrying a bunch of wives and doing a bunch of crazy things. And some of it may have been genuine religious persecution. But he said that God told me the U.S. government's going to fall 56 years from today. Well, it's still standing. And then Mormons said, well, that actually meant the Democratic Party will fall. Well, they're still standing. In fact, they're in control of everything right now. So that didn't come true. He also prophesied that when Indians received Christ, these red-faced people would turn white. And he said it actually happened. He named one Indian that when he led him to Christ and he received the the gospel of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he turned white. 
which is racism. And, and, and Joseph Smith taught that blacks can't even be saved at all because of the cursed race. And yet the, the, the LDS church has commercials all the time inviting black people to come to their church. I'm like, wait a minute. Your, your founder said we're a cursed race, and he was married to 19 different women, one of which was nine years old, which last time I checked, that's a felony. And this is the founder of your church? So you, you see that we should have known that their teaching was false because of all these false prophecies. Um, here's another prophet. Here's William Taz Russell. He's the founder of the Jehovah's Witness. I'm sure you probably have had them knock on your door. He prophesied that the world would come to an end in 1914. Didn't happen. He said, okay, no, no, no. I miscalculated 1918. Didn't happen. No, 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 I'm sorry. 1925. This one for sure. No, didn't happen. Then, okay, the world's going to change dramatically. Maybe not come to an end, but in 1975, didn't happen. And in 1989 was like the last straw. And that's when the Jehovah's Witnesses shrunk by millions because it was wrong, 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 wrong. And a lot of people got out and realized, wait a minute, this guy was, was a nut. Our founder was not all, then all cracked up. And this is a quote from William Taze Russell from the Watchtower Magazine, July 15th, page 16, 1912. The white race exhibits some qualities of superiority over any other. This is what he was inspired by God to say and recorded in the Watchtower Magazine. I guarantee you, you will not find that issue today, okay? You can Google it and you can find archives, history of it, but they will not be passing this one out anytime soon. He also said, when he was explaining why are some people inclined to worship, he said some have strong desire to worship God, others have a weak desire, and others have no desire at all. The difference is due to the shape of their brain. Again, I don't have to even comment on that. Um, but these, we can't just go back a couple hundred years ago to find false prophets. They're with us here even today. Kenneth Copin rebuked Hurricane Irma. It still did its damage. He rebuked Hurricane Harvey, and some of you here today know that it destroyed your house, Okay. He rebuked a year ago COVID-19 and said it will come to an immediate end. Didn't happen. He also said Trump will be win, win the 2020 election. Didn't happen. And I could go on and on with a list of many more. Would this qualify as a false prophet? Absolutely. What, what all these guys, and we can go into Mary Baker Eddy, we can go on all kinds of, I can go on all kinds of cults, and here's what they all have in common. Number one, they say that God speaks to them, and so therefore... They're not saying the second part. If they, if they believe that's true, then the Bible's irrelevant. Just listen to them talk. And that's why, for example, Mormons spend so much time in the Book of Mormon and very little knowledge of the Bible. You can start quoting King James Bible to them. They all brag about their King James Bible and all this stuff Bible. And then you start quoting them like, oh, no, I haven't read that before. Like they, and then in, if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you know you spend lots and lots of time in the Watchtower magazine. You got to read your, your awake magazine. You got to read that. You got to study because every Tuesday and Thursday night, you're going to be held accountable for, for knowing that. And so now, instead of reading the Bible for myself to see what God says, I got to read the magazine to find out what God says. And then Kenneth Copeland, God told me, God told me, God prophesied for this prophetic ministry and all these talks. And when you hear somebody say, My prophetic ministry, man, you need to just watch out. Just be, just be really careful. So they have that in common. They also, number two, they have a distorted view of Jesus Christ. They do not believe in a, what the Bible clearly teaches, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equally God, as it's clearly taught in the Scriptures. And they'll say stuff like, well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible, but I believe the Bible, okay? There's a lots of concepts that the Bible teaches where the word is not in there, but the concept clearly is. So they have an extra-biblical view of Scripture. They have a distorted view of Jesus Christ. And if you notice carefully from the pictures, they all look like aliens, so there's something wrong with them. So if you see someone who kind of looks like an alien, I would just stay away. Okay. That one, last one's my opinion. But anyway. But the main thing I told you is that Moses is saying, this prophet that God is going to raise up will be like me. When Jesus came on the scene, who was Israel still over, so infatuated with? And who did the Pharisees say, we follow? We are followers of Moses. Now, between Jesus and Moses, how many prophets were there? Man. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Malachi, Haggai, just, uh, just Hosea. You just go on and on, all these prophets. And none of them were close to Moses. None of them. Moses was still their idol. So that, that prophecy had not been fulfilled. But then here comes Jesus. And Jesus is like Moses in many ways, which we'll talk about. He was a from among them. He was of the tribe of Judah, from their brothers. And he said, listen to me. 
Acts chapter 8, verse 3, verse 18. So when I make this parallel from Moses to Jesus, this is not Gary's opinion reading into it. Listen to what the apostle Peter says. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, and he thus fulfilled, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And he says, but God foretold that by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and turn back from your sins that they may be blotted out. And so, and then he goes on to say in verse 22, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever Christ, in whatever he tells you. So he's, God has raised up Christ and he is the fulfillment of this prophecy that God would someday raise up a prophet like Moses. So let's ask ourselves a question. How is Jesus like Moses? Well, there's a whole bunch of amazing parallels. Number one, they were both sent by God to deliver their people. Both sent by God to deliver their people. Number two, they were both pursued and tried to be killed as infants, right? So that, that's also what they had in common. They were both spared in Egypt through God's providence. Remember Joseph and Mary, where did they flee to? Egypt. Where did, where Moses was put in a little ark, floated down river, where did he go? Egypt. And, and, and Pharaoh's daughter took care of him. Um, so they have that in common. And it was both, again, it's in Egypt. And then also, they both came up out of Egypt. Moses, after the, the manslaughter thing, he left Egypt, came out of Egypt, and Jesus came back when he was two years old, and that's when the wise men saw him, by the way. I hate to blow up your Christmas nativity scene, but anyway, after Jesus, it says, it says after G Egypt, he passes through the water. Moses goes through the Red Sea. Jesus is dipped in the Jordan River. So they both experience like a baptism of sorts of through the water. What does water represent? Noah passed through the water, judgment, right? And then you got Moses Pass through the water, judgment. And basically, Jesus is saying, hey, I am here to take the judgment of God that's supposed to be on you. I'm taking it upon me, and I'm going to die for your sins, and I'm going to experience the waters of God's judgment. They both enter into the wilderness. Jesus for 40 days. Moses, because he's thick-headed like us, it takes 40 years, but Jesus was able to do it in 40 days. But that number 40 is interesting, and, and, and obviously a time of testing, and they both go up on a mountain to deliver a new law. Moses, the Ten Commandments, Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So basically take all these ten and love your neighbor as yourself and love God first and foremost. Um, they bought, both taught with authority. Moses taught as in thus saith the Lord. And they both spoke with that authority. And, and that was the thing. When Jesus was just a little boy, Matthew 1.22 He's in the temple, 12 years old, and they're like, he's teaching with authority. And the Pharisees and the priests were all like amazed with this little kid because he spoke as one who had authority. They both miraculously fed large crowds of people in a wilderness-like place. Remember, Jesus is out in, in the wilderness, and there's like, these people are starving, they haven't eaten, they've been listening to teach all day, and there's no store nearby, and so he feeds the 5,000, and then later he does the same thing in a different wilderness place, and he feeds the 4,000, and that was just counting men. Um, they were both up on a mountain with their face shining like the sun. Of course, Moses uh, says, God, show me your glory. And God goes, if you saw my full glory, it'd kill you. So I'm going to put you here in the cleft of the rock, and I'm just going to whisk by, and I'm going to let you see the trail of my glory. And just the trail of God's glory caused Moses' face to shine. Well, Jesus didn't say, hey, show me God's glory. He said, I am God's glory. And he was shining head to toe. Everything about him, including his clothes, were shining like lightning. Moses just a face, and he put a veil over it. Jesus head to toe, everything like lightning. So how is Jesus better than Moses? Because this is a prophet that's supposed to be better than Moses. Well, Moses delivered from physical slavery, but Jesus delivered from spiritual slavery, which is the bigger issue that we deal with. Moses led 12 tribes, Jesus trained 12 apostles. Moses appointed 70 elders. Remember when Jethro said, man, you're doing too much? So he appointed 70 elders. Jesus sent out the 70 to preach the kingdom. We could spend a lot of time on each of these, but we won't. Moses said, the Lord told me, thus says the Lord. But Jesus said, but I say unto you. He said, you know, you heard it been said, you shall not kill your brother. But I say unto you, 
He's speaking in the place of God because he is God. And he says, I say unto you, if you even hate your brother, you've committed mur murder in your heart. So he's taken the, the commandments to a, a whole nother level. Moses received the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. So this is how Jesus is better. Moses was willing to die for Israel. Isn't that amazing? Think about these grumpy bunch of people who complain about everything. And Moses says, God, don't wipe them out. Take me instead. That, that's amazing. But Moses was just willing to die for Israel. Jesus actually did die for not just Israel, but for the whole world. He, he took this grumpy bunch of complaining people, you and me, and he took our place and died on our, on our cross and took our crown. Moses lifted up a, the serpent. That should say serpent. Sorry for the typo there. Moses, remember, the people were being bit by fiery serpents. And all they had to do was look to the serpent. Now, how do you twist a bronze serpent around a pole without it sliding down? You put a cross beam around it so that it twists around. So you ever seen that medical symbol of the serpent on the cross for healing? Yeah, that's where it comes from. So Moses lifted up that serpent on a cross, on a pole that had a cross beam on it. But Jesus was lifted up on the cross himself. So where Jesus is like Moses in many ways, but Jesus is better than Moses in all ways. John 3, verse 14, Jesus is speaking here. He says, as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, referring to himself, be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Amen. And notice the only requirement in this verse, and I could show you 157 other verses in the New Testament that say the only requirement for being saved is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. We know, the Philippian jailer, he had just beaten Paul and, and Silas and put them in stocks. He wasn't even ordered to put them in stocks. He just started torturing them more. And he goes and he takes a nap. And God shakes the whole jail and all the doors fall off. And the prisoners could have escaped, but they didn't because they wanted to stay, stay and hear Paul preach and sing some more. And he, this guy, the jail guard, pulls out his sword and he's about to do Harry Carey because if, if any of his prisoners escaped, he gets tortured to death. So he's like, I'm going to get this done now. And they said, hey, don't do yourself any harm. We're all still here. Not just me and Paul and Silas. All the prisoners stayed. That's a miracle in itself. He runs. Fall, the guys he had just beaten and tortured, he falls down on his face and says, Sirs, now, is, now he's real respectful. What must I do to be saved? He didn't say, oh, go get baptized. Go knock on 400 doors. Give lots of money to the poor. Make sure you tithe to your church. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as the only hope of salvation, you're saved. It's, it's that, 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 that very clear what the Bible spells out here. And did you know that you could do that right here, right now, today? I want to ask two groups of people to pray this morning. Number one, if you know for sure you're saved, I want you to pray that God, the Holy Spirit of God, would move upon hearts and open blind eyes and open hard hearts. If you're here today and you're not sure that you know Christ your Savior, I want you to bow your head and just block out everything that might distract you and ask yourself, do I know Jesus personally? Have I been born again? Have I been trusting in my own goodness, hoping that God would somehow give me salvation like because I've earned it? Or did Jesus mean what he said on the cross when he said, it is finished? Everything that... The, could be done to save you has been done it is a free gift the bible over and over again calls it a gift you don't work for it you don't deserve it you can't earn it you simply receive it jesus christ has offered himself as a free gift he not only offers eternal life he is eternal life would you receive him right now here today would you believe that he died for you that he was buried and that he rose again you, you might want to pray a prayer something like this. The prayer will not save you. It's faith that will save you. But you might pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've done a million things wrong. I fail every day. And I hopelessly cannot improve myself. But I know that you died for me. You took my punishment on that cross. That should have been me with nails in my hands and a crown in my head. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying in my place. I trust you to save me from all my sins. 
I give my life to you because you gave your life for me. I make you the Lord, the king of my life right here, right now. And I believe that you saved me in Jesus' name. Amen. So if, you've, if you prayed that prayer and you made, more importantly, you put faith in Christ, I want you to let me know about it, okay? I want to help you walk through your next steps as a new believer in Christ. This is my cell phone number. You can call me or text me anytime. Um, let me go through a few quick announcements here. If you're new to Revolution and you're trying to check things out and you want to know more about us, there's two ways you can do it. You can come every Sunday for a few months or you can come to the Newcomers Luncheon and find out pretty much everything about us in a couple hours and get some free barbecue to boot, okay? So the lunch is provided for free. Members are welcome to come on their own dime. Uh, new people, we will buy your lunch. We're going to meet at Bighorn Barbecue, the one over there on the service road of 288. And we'll get there like 12, 15-ish after we get everything done put away here. Uh, so feel free to meet us over there and we will answer any questions you, you have about Revolution. And we can um, also, you can meet some of our leaders. If, you're, if this is your first time, we want to give you a t-shirt, okay? We have lots of t-shirts out there at the back. Just fill out one of those connect cards, and we can give that to you. Or you can make a $10 donation if, you are, if you're not a guest and you just want a t-shirt. Um, so um, you can, uh, I'm trying to, over the next few weeks, systematically talk to everybody in the church. I know through this pandemic, we've kind of been distancing, but all that, thank the Lord, is winding down. But I want to just talk, just have a 10-minute conversation or more if you like, just so you can tell me what's going on in your life, and then over the phone, I can pray with you. So um, also, uh, we're just going to continue to wash our hands, and if anybody here this morning, you test positive this week, let us know, because that means we will not have in-person services next week, because in theory, everybody here could have been exposed. But thank the Lord that's not been happening lately, but if it does, please let us know as soon as possible. And I want to continue to thank you for being a super generous church, and there's all kinds of great things we're able to do because you're so giving. Um, also, um, and one of those things, actually, let me go back here. One of those things is people have been asking about the building fund. We do have a building fund because we don't have our own building yet, so we are saving up for that. So if you want to continue to give to that, you certainly can. Um, we definitely need um, more volunteers in the children's area as we try to expand, and maybe someday we'll go back to 9 o'clock Bible classes as well. Um, but if you would like to volunteer maybe once a month or even once every other month, here's my wife, Tammy. Tammy, say hi to everybody. You can text her or talk to her. Um, Isaiah, would you get Mr. Rick and take places, trade places with him real quick? So we have three life groups right now. We used to have a lot more, but COVID kind of squashed that. We want to expand and do more and more life groups. Um, there's one that meets Wednesday nights in Santa Fe. Um, and Rick's, Rick, uh, him and the, the Munozes host that. And then there's two that meet on Thursday night, one in Pearland and one in Texas City. So Rick, come on up here. He's going to briefly share with you just what life groups mean to him. Rick, how long have you been coming to Revolution Church? Lost track. Time flies. I met Rick and his wife Heather at Bounce Town one Sunday afternoon, and the rest is history. Yeah, sorry, we were giving your kids blue icing. So. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so life groups. I was thinking about this last night, and I was, uh, was going to write something down, but I, I wanted to come up here and just be, like, genuine and just, like, whatever God laid on my heart to give to you about this today. And I think it's just about people. So it's about learning uh, people's names, but uh, going beyond that and <coughs> digging into, like, their life and doing life with them. And so one of the big stories for us this year was Mark um, and all of the stuff he went through. And had we not been in life group together and and – had been doing life together and him going through that, I wouldn't have been able to, I'm out of breath. <sighs> I wouldn't have been able to um, sympathize and to be uh, one heart with him while he was going through that, you know. Um, nobody could go in there and so calling Karen and asking her how she's doing and talking to Mark and saying, hey Mark, how are you doing? And going, uh, going through that, being there in the hospital. Uh, without life groups, that wouldn't happen. You know, we would come here and we'd be like, hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. And it'd just be surf surface level and we'd never be able to dig into um, real life. You know, what's hurting? What, how, how can I help you? You know, you lost your dad. You lost your mom. You lost, you know, this. Or maybe it's to celebrate. It doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Maybe it's I got a promotion at work. You know, I'm the only one that hasn't got laid off yet this year. You know, it's so we can celebrate and just do life together. Uh, for Art, he always drives down and he gives my wife pumpkin cakes. 
that's something that that wouldn't happen without life groups but we didn't even know them they live at the end of our street and we never had ever met them until we came to bounce town and pearland then life group and alvin and then met art in them and they live literally what six seven houses at the end of our street so we wouldn't we've never met them without life groups and so uh for me life groups is about the people uh it's about uh doing life together and then it's about digging into god's word right so it's about showing up and fellowshipping but then giving a safe place to ask hard questions uh one of the questions that uh one of the we have a lot of students in ours and a lot of kids. I think the other day we had 25 people and most of them were kids. So it's, it's insane. Um, but one of the kids asked, well, how do you get a demon? I'm like, how do you, that's not even a question I would ask. But, you know, it's a safe place. We've, we've created a safe place. So you can ask anything you want to. Uh, one of the adults said, you know, if God hardens hearts, and he's the one that unhardens hearts so that you can be saved, then why doesn't he just unharden everybody's hearts so they can get saved? And it's those kind of questions that maybe in church we're not asking. We're like, hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, I'm, I'm fine today. Don't, I don't need to answer those questions, but it, we are able to do that through life, through life groups, giving people a safe place to ask those questions. All right, that's Great. It. Thank doing. you. I appreciate it. All right, we will have communion next Sunday, so we want to invite you to join us for that. All right, we're going to do question and answer, and uh, this is Sophia Hoffler is going to come up, and she's going to help me with that. She's going to use this microphone over here. The Hofflers are new to Revolution Church, and so looks like we got lots of questions. We're going to, we're going to break you in good here this morning, Sophia. You're going to, um, so you know how to do this, obviously, the ones with the, the blue dots, and we'll start with that one right there, and you can just keep going back and forth. All right. Okay. Um, it says, I had a conversation with someone who presented a difficult question, and I didn't feel that my answer was very good. Their question was, if Jesus died for all my sins, and if non-belief is a sin, didn't Jesus die also for my non-belief? So why do we need to make a choice to believe if all my sins are already washed away? My response was that mankind made active decisions and rebelled against God. Jesus' sacrifice was a gift to forgive and restore fellowship with God. We need to make the active decision to go back to God and accept the gift that Jesus offers. Great. Yeah, you did answer you did answer it well. So let's say you're in court and you've got $1,200 worth of traffic tickets and warrant fees and all that stuff and you can't afford to pay it. Okay? And I step up and say, hey, Your Honor, I'll spend six months in jail for them. The judge looks at you and says, will you accept this offer? This person's willing to pay for everything, and in theory already has by the offer, but you can reject it and say, no, no, I want to go to jail myself. Okay? So yes, Jesus has paid for all sins, including your sin of unbelief, but if you don't re accept the gift, you can decline a gift, and therefore you still don't have it. Even though, like if you gave someone a Christmas present, it's bought and paid for, but they can still say, no, I don't want your gift, even though it's already bought and paid for. So, yes, unbelief is already bought and paid for, but you can decline the gift, which is what people do. And back on the hardening of heart things, so hardening of heart makes it more difficult to be saved, but if God doesn't involve himself in your heart at all, your sinful self can reject salvation, okay? So, and I'll, I could, I, since I, I'm, not an, I'm answering a question that wasn't asked yet, but anyway, go to the next one for us. Good job, Sophia. Um, I've read that the story of the woman caught in adultery was not original to the Gospel of John, and we should be cautious with it. What are your thoughts on it? Okay, so um, that gets into the whole manuscript debate, and there's basically two groups of manuscripts. There's textus receptus, which is the re textus receptus means generally received, and then there's Vaticanus, and then there's some others, but that's the general two groups. Uh, the King James Bible is translated from Textus Receptus. Most of the other more modern translations use a combination of the two. And so what you saw happening in some places was where you have scribes like writing out the Bible, but then they might add a note on the side saying this is what this means. But then later another scribe copies it and just puts the note in it. So now before I rattle some of you too much, 
There is nothing in the scribal variances, as they call it, that would make you think, oh, we don't know the truth. On, on things like who is Jesus, how do you get saved, all those things, all the major issues, there's no discrepancies whatsoever. On minor things like, does this story here, or was this something that was told? Because that that, remember that John also says, if we were to write down all the things that Jesus ever did, the volumes of this book couldn't contain it. So it's very possible that Jesus did something that was not in the Gospels, but someone said, let's put it in there, okay? And so then you have to analyze, well, is there anything about that story that is unbiblical? Like, for example, in the Pseudepigrapha, which is false Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, there's a story where Jesus gets in a foot race with a little boy, and the little boy beats him, so he turns him into a frog. <laughs> I mean, you laugh, which tells me that that doesn't sound very biblical, does it? Doesn't sound like something. So there's stories like that we know to dismiss. The woman taking adultery sounds like that fits in really well. So, and there's, there's hardly any other scriptures like that. That one's so unique that we could say, okay, we could say that this is more of a historical story, but maybe it doesn't belong in the Bible, but there's nothing unbiblical about it. So I would, I would do like the, the questioner asked, proceed with caution. But there's, if he said, and Jesus said to the woman, You're, you are a bad woman. He kicked her in the face. We would say, forget that story, okay? But everything about that story is very consistent with the rest of the Gospels. But again, there aren't hundreds or even dozens of scriptures like that where we're not sure where they be. We're talking fragments of words and little parts like, was, should it be he or him? You know, little minor differences like that, okay? So that story is probably the basic, biggest example of something we, that's in there that we question, but again, it's, it, it's not a problem, I don't think. Go ahead. Um, why did Jesus change the names of his students? Okay, good question. So um, he, sometimes he used names that they had already given, like Simon Peter. The Greek version of it is Cephas. So when he calls him Cephas, he's not changing his name. But it's kind of like when your mom says, Harold James, get yourself right over here right now. <laughs> he's, many times, like for example, um, Jacob means heel gripper, means the one who trips you up and is always trying to take from you. So God calls him, changes his name to Israel, which was a full name change, but every time it, Jacob would backslide, he'd call him Jacob to remind him, you're acting like the old man, not the new man, okay? Um, a lot of people say Paul's name was changed, Saul's name was changed to Paul. Actually, if you read all the way through Gospels, it, it does call him Saul again later. So both are used. I don't think Paul's a good example of a name change. But other people, uh, Matthew and Levi, both were his given names. It's just sometimes he called them one, sometimes he called them the other. Um, I'm trying to think of an example where he actually it was a total name change. I, I can't think of anything because Simon Peter, that was, both of them were given names. So I'll, I'll have to think on that one more. All right. In Exodus 4, it reads that Moses, two other named men, and the 70 elders went up t onto the mountain and saw God and ate in his presence. Did these 72 other people truly see God with their own eyes, stand in God's presence, and live? Okay, good. So, no, they saw, again, every time God revealed himself as like a burning bush, glowing mountain, pillar of fire, he had a token representing him. Okay, so it's still, the scripture is still consistent. And even Jesus is God veiled in human flesh. Does that make sense? So there's always some filter between you seeing the full glory of God. So when they say, like, if I, if I say I saw Patrick, well, actually, I'm not seeing all of Patrick because thankfully he's clothed. I'm not seeing. So, <laughs> so therefore, there's another sense of was going to say, hey, I saw Patrick, okay, because you know, whatever it may be. So God is veiling himself, okay. Patrick's like, that's the last time I sit on the front row. Okay. <laughs> Um, didn't the witch at Endor call up Samuel to speak to Saul in 1 Samuel 28? Okay, so that's a, great, that's a great example. And I believe the answer is yes and no. If you read the story, read the, say the passage again. Uh, 1 Samuel 28. So read Samuel 28. The witch does her conjuring, and when Samuel actually appears, she's horrified wait a minute, it actually worked. Because <laughs> she's used to being like little hocus pocus and sleight of hand and little smoke and mirrors. But then Samuel actually appeared, which was the exception because God's the one that actually brought him up. She can't bring up anybody. That's why she was shocked and almost wanted to die 
when it actually happened because God actually brought it up. So great question. All right. Um, I heard that the Bible can be used against you in an argument. Is it possible for the Bible to be used against someone without being taken out of context, such as the Bible supports more killing than the Holocaust? Okay, um, so two questions basically there. Can the Bible be used in context to hurt somebody? Yes, because the Bible says it's supposed to speak the truth in love. So if I see someone smoking a cigarette, and I don't even know them. I can go up to them and say, the body's, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You should be doing that. Well, I've just sinned against them because I don't even know the person. I haven't, developed a, I haven't even earned the right to criticize them. And here I am using a scripture in context to hit them over the head with. But then the other one is out of context. The Bible condones more killing than the Holocaust. Again, that's not. The Holocaust was the killing of innocent, innocent people. If you want to say that, then you could say that World War II defeating Hitler we killed more people than Hitler killed. Well, that could be accurate, but we had a just cause. We're, stop, we're, we're stopping an evil despot. He was killing innocent, helpless, harmless people. So there's a difference. And so when the Bible condones killing, they were at war. They were going up against people who were slaughtering babies. And God says, you guys are going to kick them out of their country because they don't even deserve to be living there anymore. And you're going to wipe them out. So going to war. How many times has America gone to war because we've seen people killing their own? Remember Iraq, mustard gas, killing their own people? And we went to war. And everybody's like, yeah, that's a just war. So that's twisting words saying we've, you're comparing innocent life versus war. God, the Bible says God is a God of war. There's a time and a place. Um, my mom's birthday is December 7th when Pearl Harbor was attacked. So when she was 14 years old, she's washing dishes and she hears on the radio Roosevelt saying, we've gone to war. Okay? Well, Japan attacked us. We had to fight back. And if, if you study history, the next target after Hawaii was L.A. But their planes, refueling problem messed up, so they had to turn around and go back. They were going from Waikiki to L.A. And God stopped them. So anyway, so were we wrong in bombing Okinawa? No, we had to stop because the J Japanese would not surrender. That's what they were doing, kamikazes. They're like, if we have to commit suicide, we're going to not stop dying for, our country, for the empire. All right. Um, who are the 12 apostles? Like, can I name them? Yeah, just <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> Peter, um, John, Matthew and Mark are not. Neither is Luke, okay? So Matthias replaced one of them. James the less, James the more, Andrew, Nathan, and I think Nathan and Andrew are two people. I don't know. See, Tammy can name them, probably. She teaches. So she, I, has I, a song for she has a song for it, I'm sure. So anyway, I'm going to plead ignorance. No, I cannot uh, uh, name all 12 off the top of my head. Judas was obviously one of them, okay, and still he got hanging out in a bad crowd. Um, all right. So yes, I plead ignorance. I can't name all 12 on the spot. So... Any others? No. All right, great. Give Olivia a hand. She did a good job. Thank you so much. All right, so band, if you want to come up, we're going to stand and sing. And how do we sing now? We sing, we sing loud, yeah. Give the Lord. All right. If, you're, if it's good to be in God's house, say, say amen. 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 amen.
you stepped into time You laid down your life to save us You took all our shame On the cross it was saved Never be the same, never be the same. We go from glory to glory to glory. We're forever changed, we're forever changed. You call me a friend. To your endless kingdom By the blood I was made No longer a slave